relatively normal life lived by other philosophers. Kant may have been indifferent toward his own family, but he appears to have enjoyed life among the rich families where he was employed as a tutor. His appearance was as much an oddity as his character. He was less than five feet tall, and his head was disproportionately large for his body. His frame suffered from a slight corkscrew twist, which made his left shoulder droop, his right shoulder curve back, and his head tend to lean to one side. Dressed in threadbare clothes, and with scarcely a fennec to his name, he had not exactly been the hit of the campus at the University of Königsberg, which was itself hardly a centre of cosmopolitan society. But now, decked out by his employers in his elegant tutor's outfit, and encouraged to mingle with family guests, Kant positively blossomed. He soon developed a ready wit, acquired a veneer of sophisticated assurance, and became a mean hand at the card and billiard tables. When the families departed for their summer vacations in the country, Kant accompanied them, sometimes journeying almost forty miles from Königsberg. This was the farthest he was ever to travel from his provincial home city throughout his life. But this period of comparative elegance was only a phase. In 1755, at the age of thirty-one, Kant was at last able to take his degree at the University of Königsberg, partly owing to the charity of a pietist benefactor. This was late to be finishing a degree, and as we shall see, Kant was an unusually late developer. By this age, almost all the other major philosophers had already begun formulating the ideas for which they would be remembered. Not until two decades later did Kant really begin to produce original philosophy. Kant was now able to take up a post at the university as a privat docent, junior lecturer. This post he held for the next fifteen years, living a bachelor academic existence of unremitting industry. During this time, he lectured mainly on mathematics and physics, and published treatises on a wide range of scientific subjects. These included volcanoes, the nature of winds, anthropology, the cause of earthquakes, fire, the aging of the earth, even the planets, which he predicted would all one day be inhabited. Those farthest from the sun, developing the species with the highest intelligence. Yet Kant's natural bent was toward speculation. He continued to read widely in philosophy. In rationalistic philosophy, his ideas were most influenced by Newton and Leibniz. Newton's greatest achievements may have been in physics and mathematics, but in those days these subjects were still considered part of philosophy as natural philosophy. The full title of Newton's greatest work is Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. Kant studied Newton with sufficient thoroughness to propose a new theory of motion and rest, which opposed Newton's view. The fact that he had misunderstood Newton is not the point. He was being led to speculate on systems which encompassed the universe, and was willing to question the greatest intellect of the era on his own ground. According to Leibniz, the physical world of cause and effect proved the inner harmony of the world's moral purpose. Reading Leibniz. Led Kant to see humanity as not only participating in nature, but over and above this, participating in the ultimate purpose of the universe. At the same time, Kant's interest in the philosophy of science led him to read the Scottish philosopher Hume. Kant was impressed by Hume's insistence on experience as the basis of all knowledge. This squared with a scientific approach. But Kant found himself unable to accept the sceptical conclusions that Hume drew from his rigid empiricism. According to Hume, all we experience is a sequence of perceptions, and this means that such notions as cause and effect, bodies and things, even the controlling hand of God the Creator, are all mere suppositions or beliefs. None of them is ever actually experienced. Surprisingly, Kant was also struck by the emotional appeal of Rousseau. The first of the Romantics, Rousseau was the most unacademic of all philosophers, believing in personal expression through emotion more than rational thought. His advocacy of liberty was to prove a heady inspiration for the French Revolution. Kant may have been an essentially dry character, but there was something in Rousseau that touched a chord in his deeply suppressed emotions. 
beneath the facade of the prim academic, beat the heart of a closet romantic, and this was later to become apparent in his philosophy. But for the time being, all these disparate elements—Newton, Leibniz, Hume, Rousseau—remained just that. Not until Kant found a way of reconciling and absorbing these influences would he be able to produce original philosophy, and the enormity of such a task would take a long time. Perhaps Kant became impatient, for there now occurred an odd episode. Instead of publishing another serious academic work, Kant wrote a curious satirical book called *Dreams of a Ghost Seer Elucidated by Means of Metaphysical Dreams*. The ghost seer of the title is the Swedish visionary mystic Swedenborg, famous for his descriptions of his lengthy travels through heaven and hell. In 1756, Swedenborg had published his eight-volume masterwork *Arcana Gölestia*. The secrets of heaven. Unfortunately, sales did not go well, and after ten years, only four copies had been sold. One of these is now known to have been bought by Kant. These volumes of metaphysical mumbo jumbo had a profound effect on Kant, enough to inspire him to write an entire book satirizing them. As Kant whimsically declares in his introduction. The author confesses with a certain humility that he was so simple-minded as to track down the truth of some tales of the sort mentioned. He found, as usual, where one has nothing to look for, he found nothing. Yet it soon became evident that Kant's mockery of the worst visionary of them all and of sundry airy thought worlds hewn out of fraudulent concepts is not quite what it seems. Beneath his consistent raillery and expressions of intellectual contempt, is an unmistakable element of profoundly serious interest in Swedenborg. Kant longed to believe in metaphysics, even if not in quite such an extreme form. But his formidable intellectual development was beginning to close down this avenue. Kant's writing style is notoriously prolix and difficult, but by all accounts his lectures were quite the opposite. His body was so short and twisted that only his bewigged head, with its prim, precise features, was visible above the lectern. But this talking head was a font of wit, fascinating erudition, and ideas. Kant's lectures were a great hit, and his fame soon spread, encouraged by his stream of treatises on scientific subjects. His celebrated summer lectures on geography always attracted crowds from outside the university. These continued for over thirty years and established Kant as the first academic teacher of physical geography, despite the fact that throughout his life he never set eyes on a mountain and may never even have seen the open sea, which was almost twenty miles away. Kant's vivid and perceptive descriptions brought to life the wonders of the distant lands that he read about with such enthusiasm during the long winter evenings, when the freezing Baltic fog drifted in through the streets of remote provincial Königsberg. Kant now also began delivering lectures on philosophy, and here it soon became apparent that he had journeyed far and wide through the hostile territories of ethics and epistemology, beyond the ultima thule of logic, and even into regions so remote from civilization as metaphysics, and had lived to tell the tale. Meanwhile, treatises on more amenable subjects, such as fireworks, military defence, and the theory of the heavens, continued to pour from his pen. Despite this, Kant was twice refused a professorship at the University of Königsberg. The reasons for this are unclear, but one suspects an element of provincial snobbery, or perhaps they just didn't like him. Either way, Kant certainly liked Königsberg. When he was offered the prestigious post of professor of poetry at the University of Berlin, he turned it down. Fortunately, in 1770, the Königsberg University authorities relented, and Kant was appointed professor of logic and metaphysics. Now, at age 46, he had grown increasingly critical of Leibniz and his rationalistic disciples, who had become the dominant force in German philosophy. Hume's empiricism seemed undeniable, and reluctantly Kant even became convinced by Hume's scepticism. Objects, cause and effect, continuity, even the self—all these appeared to be fallacious notions. They remained beyond the reach of our experience, 
which was the only certain source of our knowledge. Kant accepted this because it seemed to him intellectually irrefutable. But he was not happy with this barren state of affairs. There appeared to be no further room for philosophy to continue. Was this really the end? Then this was late to be finishing a degree, and as we shall see, Kant was an unusually late developer. By this age, almost all the other major philosophers had already begun formulating the ideas for which they would be remembered. Not until two decades later did Kant really begin to produce original philosophy. Three miles from Königsberg, this was the farthest he was ever to travel from his provincial home city throughout his life. But this period of comparative elegance was only a phase. In 1755, at the age of thirty-one, Kant was at last able to take his degree at the University of Königsberg, partly owing to the charity of a pietist benefactor, suffered from a slight corkscrew twist which made his left shoulder droop, his right shoulder curve back, and his head tend to lean to one side. Dressed in threadbare clothes, and with scarcely a fennec to his name, he had not exactly been the hit of the campus at the University of Königsberg, which was itself hardly a centre of cosmopolitan society. But now, decked out by his employers in his elegant tutor's outfit, and encouraged to mingle with family guests, Kant positively blossomed. He soon developed a ready wit, acquired a veneer of sophisticated assurance, and became a mean hand at the card and billiard tables. When the families departed for their summer vacations in the country, Kant accompanied them, sometimes journeying almost fortuitously normal life lived by other philosophers. Kant may have been indifferent toward his own family, but he appears to have enjoyed life among the rich families where he was employed as a tutor. His appearance was as much an oddity as his character. He was less than five feet tall, and his head was disproportionately large for his body. His frame 